now, our, before, we have a wonderful panel coming up. And, but first, we have uh, Dr. Eileen Boris, who's from UC Santa Barbara. She's whole professor in the Department of Feminist Studies. She's no longer chair. She's <laughs> and, and very happy about that. And directs the Center for Research on Women and Social Justice. And her books include Intimate Labors, Cultures, Technologies, and Politics of Care, and Caring for America, Home Health Makers, Workers in the Shadow of the Welfare State. So I'm very happy to have Eileen here. Let's welcome her. And I'm so happy to be here. It's so wonderful to be among sisters and brothers in a morning like this. I wrote my, or put together my talk uh, in the middle of the Kavanaugh chaos, and when I was very optimistic. And right now I don't know whether to cry or to yell, but I think we get mad. But we should remember, those of us who are students of U.S. history, that when women got the vote, there was not necessarily a women's block. And the, the very different decisions of the senators from Alaska and Maine reinforce that. And it reminds us, when we talk about women in the New Deal, or my topic today, toward a new New Deal and the women shall lead, that women itself is a category that crosses other structures and identities. So while the gender gap is becoming a gender chasm, uh, and certainly there's a big difference between older white women and younger women of color today, there has been throughout the 20th century, from the progressive era of the early 20th century to the women who carry that vision of social justice into the New Deal, into the 1960s, because the New Deal generation was there in the 1960s. They were our elders, and sometimes we protested against them, but we learned from them as well. So I wanted to be optimistic in putting together this talk. I wanted to talk about what a new New Deal would look like and introduce you to some of the social movements because the world we live in today is not exactly the same world as the New Deal, partially because of the New Deal and the great society, but also because of neoliberal backlash, heteropatriarchy, which is pushed against the social movements of the 1960s and beyond, and the global world in which we have a new kind of economy. Suggest so that coalitions are possible, but we don't want to go back to the world of our, that envisioned by our predator and liar in chief. <laughs> America is all, we are the ones who will make America great again. And so, the reverberations in my talk with what we heard yesterday is uncanny, but perhaps not. So I, too, begin with Michelle Alexander. Susan, I began the conference with her. Uh, and here's the wonderful graphic that came with her uh, piece in the uh, Sunday Review of the New York Times recently. We are not the resistance. And by that she meant we shouldn't really use the term resistance against Trumpism because that's become too much of a hodgepodge of forces, particularly after the resistance from within, which someone who didn't like the style of the Trump White House but sort of agreed with the ends. But as up, we are the upholders of American democracy, committed, as Michelle Alexander, who is the author, if you don't know, of the uh, new... Jim Crow against the carceral state, uh, 
We are the ones committed to radical evolution, which I would argue the New Deal was a part. But we're mad. Journalist Rebecca Traster summed it up last month after the first Kavanaugh hearing. And you thought Trump voters were mad? American women are furious. Or she puts there, there is out there a yearning for a new order. So the question is, will it be a new New Deal? To play off of what uh, Stephanie Ann Johnson uh, challenged us yesterday. What would a new New Deal consist of? Where is the leadership coming from? And are we willing to symbolically and maybe physically take a knee? The fury is palpable, as the hearings showed. For after all, the judge, who is a liar, like um, it seems, to use the Stephen Colbert, so it seems, um, <laughs> may say that Roe v. Wade is settled. <clears throat> But we know there's many ways to chip away settled law. And this court has overturned a settled law already, two of them at least, uh, the Voting Rights Act, a major provision, and uh, the Abu case in terms of trade union uh, fair share. So it's very w willing to destroy voting rights and, and the right to collect the bargaining and have trade unions. So don't believe it. What I want to do, though, is give you a sense of how women are leading. Looking at the organizations <coughs> and the movements for economic and social justice today. Women are there rebuilding the Democratic Party from the ground up, in the local level. I don't know how many of you went to forums and protests in the last two years. I know we many, many people, not only elder people, when, uh, when our congressperson came, who's one of the few Latinos in Congress, came to talk about the Affordable Care Act and defending it. I don't know how many of you marched in the streets, whether in Washington or locally, in the Great Women's March, or how many of you stood on corners to protest family separation, but women are taking the lead around the country. Through vigils, through getting arrested in the Capitol. With the courts being remade by the Federalist Society's long-term plot, the state houses have become the front lines of this battle. The local experimentation is necessary. And it's in that local level from the women's clubs in which so many of the New Deal women came out of, the leaders, and the suffrage movement, we too have our new movements for the vote again, but the vote for everyone. Okay. So it is women who have a stronger public, who are for a public uh, safety net, a higher public investment in education, health care, and support for individuals with disabilities. But I want to take us back to um, the last time we thought there might be a new New Deal <laughs> in 2008 election. And we weren't only one. I mean, Time Magazine uh, I had this famous cover. Uh, and following the election of Barack Obama, we thought a new New Deal might happen. We feminist historians were not the only ones, and certainly Obama, compared to some of his predecessors, uh, supported women's health, supported uh, women's opportunity, and I think Ms. Uh, optimistically said this is what a feminist <laughs> looks like. This kind of reminds me when uh, we were being told that Bill Clinton was our first black president. Well. The nation, of course, when Obama was elected, was on the verge of the most intense economic crisis since the 1930s with the failure of the banks and the subprime uh, mortgage crisis, all the foreclosures. 
And the media was speaking of the man session. And there was a feminist academics, historians and uh, feminist economists, we got together and we raised an alarm. We said, what about the women? Would the recovery reenact the New Deal past of focusing on heavy infrastructure on jobs associated with men, which we thought was wrongheaded, in our view, not because manufacturing was suffering, but because women were less present in such work, but also because we lived in a very different economy, <coughs> one dominated by services and finance, white and pink collars rather than blue collars. Well, it turned out that in some ways, Obama came through for more for women than we expected, directly and indirectly. Now, whether he successfully came through for most of us, or uh, save capitalism yet again, some people charge that's what FDR did, uh, is still up for debate. As a historian, we need some distance. Women ended up benefiting because they predominated in many targeted sectors for federal intervention in the economy after the 2008 crash. The Small Business Administration loans went to women three times more than men. The Recovery, Education, Jobs, and Medical Assistance Act saved jobs of teachers, nurses, and other public sector and health employees, three quarters of whom were women. Also women, about half the number of students in community colleges, which also were beneficiaries of training uh, monies. The funding of public assistance and the expansion of the Earned Income Tax Credit reached poor women. And the Affordable Care Act, has made a tremendous difference in covering women's health, especially preventive care. Although with the Hobby Lobby decision, you're kind of dependent on your employer whether you can get birth control covered, which of course is part of the problem. And so the first thing that uh, Obama did was sign the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. He appointed two women to the Supreme Court and Sonia Sotomayor was certainly a first. As I mentioned, the Affordable Care Act was quite uh, important in, for women's health. And that's why the attacks on it are not just attacks on public funding, but they're really part of attacks on women. And then something that I think is important, Obama ended the companionship rule, which was a Department of Labor regulation uh, from 1975-76 that when domestic workers got into the Fair Labor Standards Act, one group of domestic workers were taken out, home health care workers. They were redefined as elder companions. Well, if they didn't know then, certainly the healthcare system has changed tremendously. Well, as I said, the world of the New Deal is not exactly our world. And we have the shift, as the change in the companionship law suggests, between the male breadwinner to the female caregiver as the prototypical woman worker, and also, I would argue, as the face of organized labor and organized protest. So here's a you know, iconic image of the male worker from the New Deal, and here is an image of the female caregiver. And so the worker, <coughs> these two are, you know, work pays America, and it's the farmer and the laborer from the WPA. And the images that we've been seeing of the woman worker She's sewing, or she's a house being trained as a housekeeper. These are commodified forms of what academics call reproductive labor, of housework, of the unpaid work. But it's the work that's devalued. And so the sexual division of labor was not as challenged, even as, and this is the key, the complexity to the New Deal legacy, even as, opportunities for women artists and writers were through the various projects 
of the WPA and elsewhere. So we have this iconic uh, worker. And there's an academic critique out there uh, that some of you know that uh, the New Deal sustained a racialized gendered state. That is, that it didn't really challenge the existing order, even though it gave more to black workers uh, if you were an immigrant, if you were a white immigrant, so-called a European immigrant, you were assimilatable. If you were a Mexican, may, you probably would not get New Deal resources, but it, it, because of the local implementation of the New Deal order. Okay. Well, in the 1930s, we had uh, the family wage. We believed in the male breadwinner wage. The assumption was that men earned money and women spent money. And this division of labor did not dismiss consumer power. So Eleanor Roosevelt talked about that as we heard in It's Up to the Women and later in my day. It is the women who will save our country. The NRA, the Blue Eagle, by buying under decent labor standard. For women are seen then as the purchasers of the transformers of the wage into usable goods for the family, while men are seen, why can't you give my dad a job as the breadwinner? Yeah. Oh, okay. The uh, National Recovery Administration, which is one of the alphabet agencies of the New Deal. Yeah. Uh, and that was the symbol of the Blue Eagle, which it was like the consumers and the fair trade and the anti-sweatshop movement of today, if you think about it. it uh, if you abided by labor standards, which were determined by industry committees that had government representatives and uh, business uh, and uh, worker representatives, then you could have this sign in your store window uh, of the, you know, we do our part, the Blue Eagle, and then people are supposed to buy from that store or that good. It's like the union label. It was actually an extension of the union label. And we, and given these assumptions of the male breadwinner, security would be for families. More security for the American family. We have this image here, and the idea was it would be the widow of the man. The, when the insured worker dies, leaving dependent children and a widow, both mothers and children will receive a monthly uh, benefit. But of course, not all men qualified for Social Security at the beginning. The jobs that African-American, Mexican-American men were in, like agricultural labor, the jobs that many women were in, in the service sector were not initially part of Social Security or the Fair Labor Standards Act. Frances Perkins called herself a half a loaf girl. She was into half a loaf. And once you got the foundation, then the next 30 years were struggles to increase and continue to the present of inclusion, whether it was in Social Security or in labor standards. But the fact is, that um, men did lose their jobs two or three times the rate of women. In the um, early, uh, in, and in the Depression, women's wage uh, job loss came later. But by the end of the 1930s, women were about a quarter <laughs> of the total labor force. And today, women, about 60% of women are in the labor force. Uh, and two thirds of uh, households really depend on women's um, earnings. And so while we had the demand for Social Security with this assumption of the male wage in the 30s, today the security issue is family and medical leave and getting that paid parental leave. And even though there's, you know, it's gender neutral, moms, dads, and kids, it, the benefit has been predominantly 
for women. And states like California, again, the experiment station in the states, have begun for paid sick days and paid family leave. And the California uh, law, uh, which has just come into effect, California can get up to six weeks with minimum, for minimum wage workers at 70% of their income. And for those people whose earnings are up to $108,000, get 60% of their income. This is progressive. This is in, beginning in the states. And so the notion of security for families now must be not just for the widow, but for the working woman herself. The pregnancy should not be a disability in the workplace. Well, we have a changing face of labor leadership to reflect the shifts in the economy and the centrality of women and men and women, white women and men and women of color in organized labor. Today, women are 46% of union members and will be the majority by 2025, if we still have a labor movement. The 36% of organized workers are people of color, but of course it varies by industry and union. And it also, of course, many workers are not unionized. The rules of the game have been since the Taft-Hartley Act in, in uh, 1948 been chipping away at the possibility of trade unionism. So in the 1930s, we had William Green, originally from the uh, mine workers, uh, again, the extractive, the, the masculine manufacturing, is head of the AFL, CIA, AFL, and John L. Lewis, of the miners, head of uh, what becomes the CIO. And Lewis is fascinating. I want to read you something he said, or summarize something he said, in testimony for the Fair Labor Standards Act in um, either, I think was, this is from 1938 testimony, in, in which he said, uh, he called for a living rather than merely a minimum wage so that women's employment would come out of desire, not need. If women did undertake the same work as men, Lewis contended, they should receive equal pay a position which unionists long have held to protect wages, really, uh, rather than to boost women's rights alone. Family members, by which he meant women, should then work out of choice, not because wages of men are too low. Well, today, the face of organized labor is female. Liz Schuller is the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO, she worked for the electrical workers as an organizer and a lobbyist. Mary Kay Henry is not only the first woman uh, head of a huge union, the Service Employees International Union, but she's the first out lesbian. And she initially organized the healthcare sector in California, then ran the healthcare division for SEIU. And under Mary Kay Henry's leadership, the innovative Fight for 15 movement uh, to change the rules for organizing the service sector uh, for uh, fast food workers has come under her. And Mary Kay Henry has said, a new deal for, has argued that we need a new deal for America's working poor. And if we look at those sectors of the new deal, that were excluded, those sectors of the workplace that were excluded in the original New Deal. Agriculture. We have from exclusion to leadership today. So farm workers were outside the labor law until 1966. Today, a third of farm workers are women. They remain overwhelmingly immigrants. Dolores Herter was the secretary treasurer of the United Farm Workers. But today, the new president, the third president of the U.S., of you, is Teresa Romero. Now, she didn't work in the field, but she feels she has a connection to the women who do. As she's put it, women can do everything, and we want the opportunity to do it. But they want to be paid equally, 
and treated respectfully. And as, I don't know how many of you saw the Frontline special on sexual harassment in the fields and in the offices that Benice Yang, who lives in the Bay Area, put together, the journalist. Uh, but farm working women are, are experiencing high rates of sexual violence and harassment. And these uh, supervisors and bosses are using the sex card, the violence card, uh, because women, many of them are undocumented. And they're saying, we're going to report you to ICE if you don't give in to me. And this has been documented. But the women have fought back and are creating their own uh, resource groups. Uh, the, the janitors in California, because the, uh, the night janitors have often, also suffered from such harassment, they are, um, they have these healing circles and they actually got a law changed to be able to trace the subcontractors. Because today, with a lot of the labor law, the problem is that no one knows who the employer really is because of these chains of subcontracting. The fissured workplaces, David Wheel, who had been head of the wage and hour under Obama, put it. So it's, it's much more difficult to enforce the labor laws even when people when, are covered by them. Uh, what's also fascinating about Teresa uh, Romero is that she was born in Mexico and came to the U.S. in her, 19, in her 20s. And she has, uh, she's for mandatory mediation and she's really fought for uh, protection of, from heat and for overtime and has given a space for indigenous workers whose uh, first language isn't Spanish. Oh my God, I'm five minutes, okay. One of the issues that women are taking the lead, of course, is the question of border control. Here is a Dorothy Lang um, paint, uh, photograph from 1937. Uh, and a major group is We Belong Together. And that is a, um, a group of, um, in support of women, in support of common immigration reform, to keep families together and empower women. And it's an offshoot of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Uh, and the domestic workers group is crucial because their memberships, many of them are immigrants or their families are immigrants. And and it is the recognition that unless you have reasonable immigration reform, how can you organize a group of workers? And who will do the care work? And so women have been also in the lead uh, for ending um, family separation. Who were excluded from the New Deal, who are taking major leadership, not only with We Belong Together, but also caring across the generation. And here's the banner of the National Domestic Worker Alliance. And I have the women themselves in solidarity and in collectivity rather than the major spokesperson, Ajahn Poo, who I love, who's amazing, because it is a movement of coalitions, of ethnic groups, that have organized by community and by locality. And what the domestic workers have gained, workers who are outside of the National Labor Relations Act, who don't have a right to collective bargaining under the law, but, and, were, and some of them excluded from labor standards, and even if they are in minimum wage, maximum hour, who's going to enforce it in the home? But they have mobilized. They have educated themselves. They have developed organic leadership. And they have gained in about, I think it's eight or nine states now, Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. And in some, uh, most recently, I believe it's Seattle, uh, Washington, and the city, having these commissions, essentially wage boards of progressive era idea that Francis Perkins and others brought into the New Deal, because the Fair Labor Standards Act originally had wage boards, 
connected it from low wage to lowest wage workers, to actually determine fair wages. And the domestic workers asked to be treated like all other workers, but also to recognize that the home as a workplace is a very different workplace. And so in these Bill of Rights, there's such things as uh, to be paid for wait time, even if it's overnight. If you're a live-in worker, to be able to have the kind of food you wish, to have enough food, not to have your passport taken away from you. Because some people would argue where we have seen modern-day slavery is in both the uh, embassies and their staff, but also among some of the migrant uh, domestic workers. And where has been the movement of the labor movement? It is fighting for what I call the care work economy. It's been the teachers and the nurses. And it's really been the upsurge of teachers who some of them were not even unionizing the so-called right to work, which means right not to join a union state, beginning in West Virginia and spreading. And then the nurses who asked not only for higher wages, but decent working conditions, which include adequate ratios of nurses to patients and staffing. Because when nurses are given poor working conditions, when teachers are not given the right supplies, their consumers aren't just consumers, but they're ordinary people. Okay, I'm just gonna go through a couple of images um, for you to give you a sense of some of the dynamism of the social movements today, <coughs> the March for Women's Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter, the anti-gun violence, and of course the continual fight uh, for reproductive justice. And, it, and remember their name, it's not only the men who suffered from police brutality of the black community. That environmentalism with the indigenous movement that Standing Rock reminds us. And of course, there's the Me Too and the Time's Up, and just last month, McDonald's in many major cities, including San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, was a walkout against the kind of, again, low-wage workers and low-wage working women have less protection. So it hasn't just been the uh, celebrities, but in fact, more privileged women created the Time's Up Fund that the uh, National Women's Legal Defense Fund is uh, the uh, holder of for low-wage women to fight against sexual violence at work. And if I had time, I would talk about the movement from presidential wives, who were influential, to presidential contenders. Yay. <laughs> and uh, women's place, we know, is in the House, and women have won more primaries than ever, ever. This is from uh, the um, Rutgers um, Center on Women in Politics. You can just see the number of women running. And these have been, and it's been women of color, the first Somali American. And these, are, some of these women are unionists. So um, uh, Tama, uh, Janelle, um, Alicia Presley in Boston, and of course, uh, Ortiz, uh, Cortez. And these two women uh, in Boston and in New York actually defeated longtime, somewhat liberal Democratic men, but it was a changing demographics. People are fed up. They don't want just moderation. And of course, women's place is also in the Senate. And Elizabeth Warren has offered new New Deal kinds of proposals to rein in corporate accountability, I mean, rein in corporations for accountability. And, and she was, of course, the founder of the Consumers Protection League uh, Commission that all of these things that uh, Trump is um, uh, dismantling today. But I want to uh, just give you the names of her bills, which of course have no, her proposals, which today of course have no um, possibility, but uh, she has the Accountable Capitalism Act to, uh, in terms of corporate chartering, which would demand that workers 
uh, elect shareholders, and she also has the Anti-Corruption um, and Public Integrity Act. So if we're think, looking for places where a new New Deal can emerge, uh, Warren is one. But what is this vision for a new New Deal? And I'll just make a quick list of things. And I've taken this for Ihan Omar, who's running in uh, Minneapolis, who will be elected. And it includes guaranteed access to public education. And let me remind you, the New Deal started student loans. Uh, it would provide health care coverage for all. And though Roosevelt couldn't figure out a way to do health coverage under Social Security, there was many public health clinics. Establish economic justice for working families. We've talked a lot about uh, the labor aspect. Create a just immigration system. Ensure environmental justice and energy independence, that's a new issue. Reimagine our criminal justice system. Achieve homes for all, we've talked a bit about housing in the New Deal. Build a better infrastructure. There are some things that are new, like LGBTQIA rights, uh, prevent gun violence, but there's some things that are very New Deal-ish, like invest in the arts and humanities. We are the majority, and the question is, will we just be depressed, or will we go out and put our bodies on the line however we can and work for a new, new deal? <laughs>